It's customary, isn't it? Once you finish the latest title in a series, to update your personal list of rankings. Most people do it to some degree. Or they compare the latest to their favourite within that certain series. What's the best Bond movie? Who is the best Doctor? How does Final Fantasy 2067 compare to FF7? And so on. The series I do this with most personally is Assassin's Creed. I've been engrossed in its story, lore, and for the most part gameplay as well, since the original game back in 2007. We're now at a point where we're at 12 home console entries, the last of which released in the last six months. So now it is time for me to produce my 2021 list. My name is Doragon, and this is my 2021 Assassin's Creed Rankings list. Number 12, Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Man, I'm gonna get some flack for this one. Odyssey is not a good game. I'm not even talking Assassin's Creed here, just as a video game in general. While it tries to sell itself as an RPG, the dialogue choices have no bearing on the outcome, the combat is bland, the world is empty, Supporting cast are forgettable, the narrative is bland and yet again forgettable, the character is a weird mix of RPG tropes that just don't work together, giving them no personality, the mission structure is repetitive and boring, and it is a graphical and mechanical downgrade from its predecessor. And that's not even judging it on what makes an Assassin's Creed game an Assassin's Creed game, aka being an assassin and such. Odyssey is a game that did the absolute bare minimum that it had to to achieve the designation of an RPG. It has no depth to its gameplay, world or story, and while offering a few mindless hours of time wasting, it has no longevity to the gameplay loop and no fun within it. As the 11th game in a series, it should also build on the long-standing lore and story that its preceding installments laid the groundwork on. Instead, this game takes that, throws it out of the window, and undermines thousands of hours of storytelling work from thousands of hard-working developers. Because, lol, this is easier, and now we can have superpowers! It is an affront to anyone who has ever worked on the series, and anyone who has ever bought into it. And these reasons are why it is at the bottom of my list, and my least favourite game of all time, full stop. Number 11. Assassin's Creed Syndicate. I don't dislike this game. I'm aware that it isn't quite as strong as many other installments in the series, but that doesn't mean it is terrible by any stretch. London wasn't a great choice of location, at least not at the massive scale that we got it. But there were many great moments within this game. From the killbox assassinations with their unique approaches, to gear upgrades, the first playable female character, and the World War I animus rift with massive modern day implications. The Shroud gave us hope of a Desmond return, and the cliffhanger modern day ending left me wanting more. The reason this is so low on the list is that the core concept of freedom of movement was nullified by the location choice and design philosophy of one-to-one -one scale regions, and so we had an auto zipline thing to make up for that, putting us somewhere between Assassin and Spider-Man, but not really succeeding at either. The story was weak as it had to be changed to accommodate the Ubisoft executive's directive to have a male lead over Evie, who was obviously meant to be the main character, and due to that, it fell quite flat and empty in its second half. Then the combat felt like you were a fly attacking an elephant and expecting it to die. Time constraints of an annual release schedule also took their toll on making many aspects feel unfinished. This is one of those games that should get the Snyder Cut treatment and have the original vision released as a fully functioning game and narrative. As it is though, it's just not at the level of the others, despite my love of Evie as a character. Number 10. Assassin's Creed Rogue. It's a funny thing. At the time, returning to my PS3 and the Black Flag mechanics felt good and I enjoyed my time with Rogue well. I thought it was a great game and story at the time, seeing the conflict from the side of the Templars. But as time goes by, I start to see it for what it actually is, a lazy cash grab of a game. 
It used the engine, models and assets of Black Flag, with many locations being copy-pasted from the older game. It was released on previous-gen hardware to plug the financial gap that would occur from Unity being next-gen only, and most fans having yet to upgrade. The story was only skin deep as you still operated the same as an assassin in moment to moment gameplay. Assassins waved their flags revealing their location, in direct contradiction to their rule of hide in plain sight, and their hidden attacks were completely inconsequential. The tenets of the Templar Order were only words and not paramount to the world or character building, and only a couple of moments have an impact on the overarching narrative. Despite that, there are still aspects that work for me. Sailing in naval combat was stunning in Black Flag, so a lift and shift means it's still exceptional here. The story link from Black Flag to Rogue to Unity was a really nice touch, and one of the better overarching story arcs outside of Ezio and Altair, even if it wasn't implemented throughout the entire game. Combat had one additional weapon type over Black Flag, which expanded its paired back combat options. It utilised mechanics from the exceptional Assassin's Creed multiplayer really well in the single player campaign, and the concept is one I wish was visited more often and given its own mechanics and parallel narratives. Rogue features so low on this list because like Odyssey, it did the bare minimum to be called a game. The reason it is higher than either Odyssey or Syndicate is that it does actually function well mechanically as an Assassin's Creed title, therefore giving it a leg up over the other two. Number 9. Assassin's Creed Valhalla Oh man, I hate this gonna come my way. When Valhalla does things, holy heck does it do things. The problem is, in a game that takes a good Assassin's Creed player over a hundred hours to reach the end of the campaign in, you'll get one of those things every 20 hours or so, if that. The things that make you sit up and pay attention, that link to the rest of the series, and form part of an overarching plot which has materialised out of thin air in this Layla saga suddenly. Uh, feel like footnotes left for the Wikipedia page, and don't have any bearing on Eivor or the plot. Make no mistake, this is a Viking game first, an RPG light second, and an Assassin's Creed somewhere further down the list. If this hadn't been marketed as an AC game, I'd like it a little more. But the bugs, poor pacing, awful mechanics, over-bloated, flat and boring world, a protagonist that yet again isn't an assassin, and the inability to patch day one issues six months down the line, still wouldn't allow me to like this as much as the good moments dictate that I should if it weren't named Assassin's Creed. It is such a strong start, and 20 hours rip by without worry. But then the design philosophy that is ordained by the microtransaction store hampers everything. The best loot in terms of armour and weapons are paid for. Transmog was introduced at an in-game cost designed to push further microtransactions. Positive story moments obtained from gameplay earlier in the series are sidelined here because the gameplay loop's reward is now a microtransaction. This was Darby McDevitt's swan song within Ubisoft, and it feels like he was fighting against the studio to create an actual Assassin's Creed game while they wanted a Viking game with AC slapped on the box. What we ended up with is something that is a half measure in every respect, but just about cohesive enough to elevate it to ninth place. It's a shame. I wanted to like this game, and for 20 to 40 hours I did. But engagement parameters that are measured in time spent in each area, thought by Ubisoft to measure current success, drag this game out to lengths that make you want to quit the entire series, let alone the individual title. Number 8. Assassin's Creed Unity Ah, the good old Anas Horribus. For many, this game was the lowest the series has ever stooped. That probably just means that they stopped playing at this point and they didn't play any of the titles further down this list. Unity is another game of squandered opportunity. It was the first to be built solely for the PS4 and Xbox One generation of consoles, but it was rushed out and therefore buggy. Like, Missing Faces buggy. Like, psychedelic churches where you don't know what's going on buggy. Basically, it launched in a game-breaking state, and rather than Ubisoft recognising this and working hard to fix it, I mean it's still in a fairly broken state now, seven years later, 
They took the backlash to mean that people no longer wanted Assassin's Creed as Assassin's Creed, and would abandon the core formula shortly after this game, even though that is not what players were saying. Unity, however, did a lot right. It introduced control over your free running up and down, introduced killbox assassinations, allowing you to approach a target in a manner that you wish while keeping true to the fact that ancestor memories are being experienced. It kept an expanded social stealth, allowing massive bustling cities for the first time in the series. It kept the low and high profile states that worked so well throughout the rest of the series. It introduced a crouch button for those situations where social or environmental stealth weren't available, giving Arno more tools and versatility. It enacted a love story that should have torn either character apart and did result in Arno being excised from the Brotherhood, though didn't dive too far into what this actually means, with him operating in much the same manner through the rest of the game thereafter. Its DLC, offered to everyone for free due to the launch debacle, let us see what grief can do to an assassin, and showcased how dangerous an uncaring man with those skills can be, before bringing him back from the brink. Unity was the last game to actually feel like Assassin's Creed for me, with a beautiful freedom of movement through an in-depth, if overly animation-based, parkour system, solid and fluid combat, robust and healthy social stealth, and an adherence to the Ten Commandments of making an AC game and the Brotherhood's tenets. Had it not been for the game-breaking launch state and a few moments of dragged-out plot points, this game and character had the ability to sit right at the pinnacle with the best of the Assassin's Creed series. Corporate demands and pressure that belied quality assurance and bug-squashing time, however, mean that this possible gem has not only been unfairly lambasted since launch, but left to die in an unfinished state years after its launch. Number 7. Assassin's Creed 3. Whatever came after the Ezio trilogy was always going to suffer. Ubisoft struck gold with Il Mentore, a character that players wanted to emulate once he had found his calling, who resonated with players from many walks of life and carried the series from casual intrigue to industry-leading behemoth. They were massive shoes to fill. And no matter what time period or ancestor protagonist was chosen, they were always going to be second rate to so many gamers. In then steps Rano Takeon, acted by Noah Watts, our first native character, alongside Aveline de Grand Prix, a black female character in the AC3 spin off Liberation. I realised that within the entire series, Aveline is the first playable female character, and not Evie as stated earlier. This list, however, is for mainline games only, where it took nine games for Eevee to then be the first. AC3 initially looked as if it were making a statement on equality, a stance that should be taken by all development studios. Reality was, this didn't really feature in the mainline game at all, and upon launch, it was called out by many outlets for not taking that opportunity and undermining an initial story commentary on white man's genocide of the native people, of not just the American continent, but all others around the world. The game was also, rather unsurprisingly, called a failure in comparison to the Ezio games. In terms of the game, however, I disagree. While yes, falling short in certain areas, Assassin's Creed 3 does what no other game in the series does in its ancestor memories. It questions the creed. Are the tenets uphold? Are they correct? Why does this Templar understand them more than the Assassins? For those paying attention to the narrative, AC3 makes us question everything that has come before, from Altair to Desmond. Were any of them right? Is what we're doing in the modern day section right? It even links into the DLC of Revelations, which let you relive Desmond's memories and fill in many of the character and creed blanks, including Desmond's own questioning of the creed, and that leading to his bartending in Rome as a rebellion against it. Ranu Takon is a man not of the world or society of the main antagonists in AC3, and this is shown through his naivety and ready trust of those who show some kindness. His characterization is real. I know this because at 18, I experienced much the same thing by moving across to the other side of the globe with no contacts or advice. He is a young man who is learning a completely foreign world and trusts at face value the advice of those who have lived in it all of their lives. A young man with one quest is manipulated by those who he would call friend or freedom fighter 
to further their own gain. Rano Takon starts the game angry and vengeful, and through the course of its narrative becomes obviously disenfranchised. From his mentor undermining his name, granting him a more readily accepted Irish name in Connor, discovering Achilles' dark and uncreed like past, a Templar Grandmaster as a father in cahoots with the source of his vengeance, a trusted ally who we spend much of the game assisting, being discovered as the true source of his mother's death, and while building a beautiful homestead, being left very much alone at the end of the narrative. Ranu Takon had a speech, much like those that Ezio gave in the Bonfire of the Vanities and Revelations, that was meant to end this game, and would show his strength of character and conviction superbly. This one speech elevates him to the same level as Ezio in my eyes, but alas, it was cut from the game, and for many who have never experienced it, it leaves the game with a depressing character at its core. You can find this speech readily across YouTube, and I'll link one option down below. Please listen to it, as it will change your view of the character and game. This title was also the first time the Precursors, or First Civilization as they were known back then, were front and center, and driving and impacting the story in a big way with their presence and choices changing human history. Desmond has full-blown conversations with them, or at least AI approximations of them, through the many modern-day sections that keep the story and narrative moving forward. Desmond is now a master assassin, more skilled than any who have come before him, blending the skills and convictions of Altair, Ezio, and Anotakon atop his own upbringing, skills, and experience, modernizing many of the skills obtained from his ancestors. Desmond's quest in the modern day decimates Abstergo and the Templars, putting their animus research years back, killing Daniel Cross the traitor, and killing Warren Vidic in a super satisfying moment that doesn't have any of the movie villain showdown cliches. Instead, it is done, decisive, and indicative of the master assassin that Desmond now is. Once he activates the temple as has been the mission all along in this game, Desmond is faced with a choice. Let most of humanity die and rebuild from the ashes like a messiah. Or save everyone, but unleash Juno, a megalomaniac precursor upon the world. Desmond makes a choice that many of us would not, and trusts his friend, family, and allies to save the world. He saves everyone, and changes the mission of the assassins in that moment. They no longer operate in a reactionary way. Instead, to protect liberty, freedom, and strive for peace, they must now actively take the fight to those who would quell it, most notably, Juno. I love this game. I relate heavily to the experiences of Rano Take On, and love the modern day twists and turns. It has a very Matrix feel to the overarching plot, where the heroes do not do what is expected of them, and don't adhere to stereotypes. At 12 games in, however, it sits just below the midpoint, and that should show you the strength of what is yet to come. The reason it sits so low for me is despite its own strengths, it has left a legacy that the series is still yet to recover from and signaled the downward trend in the series as a whole. Okay, disclaimer time. From this point on, from six through to two, I find that the titles can be interchangeable. I would listen to any argument from anyone as to why a title should be higher or lower in this sector, and probably agree with everything that is being said. It took me a long time to arrange these particular titles into an order for how I feel right now, having revisited most of these games within the last 12 months. This is how I feel at this moment in time, and I will try to explain why each game is in its respective spot with a little bit more depth. But this order may change in the future, and where things are now doesn't detract from the excellence of the title. It's just that the games that are left to mention are all of a quality that I feel it needs saying ahead of time, that all games that are yet coming up are brilliant, and ranking them has been extremely difficult. So, pitchforks away. Feel free to tell me why you disagree in the comments below, or even agree, and let's have a conversation. But without further ado, Let's get into the final build-up, and rank numbers 6 through 2. Number 6. 
Assassin's Creed 4, Black Flag. Look, I've already told you, pitchforks away. Let me explain myself. As mentioned, places 6 through 2 were hard to give a ranking to because of their brilliance as a whole. Black Flag is no exception, and is an absolutely stunning game. I was dubious before its launch because of the heavy pirate focus. There was very little Assassin's Creed going on from all of the trailers. But I was lucky enough to play it before launch at the UK's premier Comic Con, MCM London, before MCM priced itself out of attendance, and Black Flag won me over. On release, the game played spectacularly, though I spent much of my playthrough acting as an assassin, but not actually being an assassin, much the same way as we had operated in AC 2 and 3. Unlike those games though, where suddenly you were an assassin, Edward was unwilling to join up, and only after many different and difficult experiences did it dawn upon him that his and the assassin's ideals lined up. This was a beautiful and unique character arc for the series at this point, and somewhat shocked me by the emotional sucker punch I received from it. The game introduces many important story elements and concepts, such as sages, the observatory, and the linking of all the Isu temples, which are more labs to them, around the globe. Black Flag was bigger in terms of size, scope, story, and mechanics than anything else within the series, yet it didn't feel bloated. It balanced its open-world exploration with story impetus, and gave you specific lulls in gameplay to allow the exploration of the amazing West Indies world. Sadly, no cricket minigame though. Edward was a captivating and engaging character, with multiple layers that were slowly peeled back throughout the narrative. The supporting cast was exceptional and memorable, from Blackbeard being the badass the myths tell us that he is, to Kid being more akin to the theories and historical texts than we see in the novels, and her putting Edward on the right track. So why is this lowest of the exceptional, when so many would call it the best in the series? There's a few reasons. And most are probably personal, so probably wouldn't have any bearing on anyone else's lists. The ones that everybody can latch onto, though, are combat and free running. Combat in this game is what I would call the wrong type of simplistic. I get what the studio were going for, pair it back to improve it. And they did manage this as every weapon type feels brilliant to play with. But, like the Prince of Persia Sands of Time, Partway through your journey, that paired back to basics combat lacks depth and finesse, and once realised, as you continue using it, lacks engagement. I felt blessed when I unlocked the quad flintlocks, as it meant my combat encounters were much shorter and less boring, though even that was grating by the end of the game. The back to basics of the combat felt like a contradiction to the amazing complexities of the open world and exploration, and stuck out as a poor point of the game. Free running is much the same as Assassin's Creed 3, which utilizes many animations and removes a little of the autonomy that we had in the Altair and Ezio titles. It's not bad. In fact, compared to pretty much everything that came after it, the underlying architecture is phenomenal. But like Syndicate, the choice of location that accentuated another traversal mechanic hampered the free running brilliance that this game was capable of showing. The developers attempted to address this by building specific free run paths in many locales. And these paths are fun to use, but unlike most of the Desmond era games, repeated visits to a location do not then open up new paths or ways to traverse an area. The city locations are okay, but again don't lend themselves to a freedom of movement, with buildings placed just too far apart to build a new path through the city, therefore meeting the same challenges as Syndicate which placed much lower on this list. The personal side of things? Out of all of the games from 6 through to 2, Black Flag is the only one that I've only played once. It is the only one out of these exceptional titles that doesn't keep calling me back. I've watched people play. My brother, my partner, a bunch of people across YouTube and Twitch. But for me, it's only been a one-time thing. Now granted, that feeling of not being called back has changed somewhat in this RPG era, and there is a likelihood that I'll play it again in 2021. But the others here, I've played in the last year. And when you consider the big titles that have been releasing, and that we've had a new console generation that I have been lucky enough to be part of, 
The fact that it hasn't called me back means that even though I know it is phenomenal, I can't place it any higher than sixth on this list. Number five, Assassin's Creed. The origin point, Genesis. Without this, nothing else within this list exists or has the name upon the box. This game has always ranked highly for me. It is the game that got me hooked on the series and the reason my wallet is a, a lot lighter 14 years later. There is something wholly realized and beautiful in its simplicity that still works even today. There's even a vocal portion of the newer fanbase asking for a game that is just hunting down Order of the Ancients members. To these people I present, Assassin's Creed. Assassin's Creed brought a concept to the table that had never been tried before. It wanted to create an open world with multiple vertical and horizontal levels that you could traverse across and through. It wanted to create a stealth system, completely different from what the developer had done in previous franchises, and instead focus on hiding in plain sight among crowds and populace. It wanted open combat to be a last resort, but no less effective and real when used. And it wanted to create a story that wasn't supernatural, but science fiction and intrigue based, using gaps in human history and conspiracy theories as plot points. All of this came from the mission to create a Prince of Persia for the new generation home consoles and PC. And through research, the writers and eventual credited creator Patrice Desolais found the Hashashin and dove down a rabbit hole that led to the wonderland that is Assassin's Creed. The Creed was marketed as a historical tour of the Holy Land, but in those first moments we meet three people in the 21st century, and one of them, the player character, is a prisoner. The game threw us into a machine that allowed us to access genetic memories, explained as the same thing that allows birds to migrate in winters without prior knowledge. And that is how we were then transported to the Third Crusade. This was like no other storytelling that I had encountered in games. At the time, I was travelling the world, and lugging a PC or console around Australia wasn't really feasible. You know, other than my trusty PSP, which AC unfortunately didn't run on. So getting to experience the title was a rare treat during my travels, and in less than 20 minutes my intrigue peaked. In the next 10, we relive some of the ancestor memories, and he dies! What is this game? How on earth is this story going to evolve? Is there an endgame here? I wanted more. I wanted to know all of it. The world, its history, real world history, the Hashashin. The first hour of this game sparked so many different questions and wants within me that if it were a meal, I'd have been trying to force all of it into my mouth at once. The intrigue continued throughout once we realised Altair hadn't died, but been drugged and demoted. What were the tenets of the Creed, and how do you abide by them? Who are these people we're hunting? Weren't the Templars good guys at the likes of months ago? Where is Desmond? Can he escape? You could hack the computers in the lab when you were in control of Desmond, and it painted a grim picture of the outside world and what Abstergo, the global business conglomerate who had kidnapped you, were doing. And then came the Apple of Eden. A beautiful relic upon first viewing. But then it multiplied Al Mualim, the assassin's master and traitor to the creed who had used Altair to do his nefarious bidding. It controlled Altair and prevented him from moving for a time and then produced a globe after Altair defeated his master and touched the apple himself for the first time. This was what Abstergo were after. A relic of a highly advanced precursor race that pinpointed the locations of so many others. And it could allow Abstergo to launch a satellite array with these apples installed that they could control humanity through, as they were saying to bring peace. Desmond then realized that he could now use one of Altair's skills and activated eagle vision in the lab revealing messages left for him, painted in human blood. Roll credits. It was twists and turns galore, with setup intrigue, payoff and cliffhangers. A story well worth telling, and I fell in love with it, wanting to know more in the next one. Assassin's Creed was also mechanically and graphically sound, so much so that it even holds up today, better even than many of the games that came after it. His freedom of movement was reminiscent of the Spider-Man 2 The Movie tie-in game, and I found endless hours of enjoyment moving around the world and discovering the system's complexities. The game was shunned by many for its repetitive nature back in 2007, and those complaints can still be classed as valid. 
But for me, those thoughts are somewhat missing the point of Assassin's Creed. You spend the game re-becoming a master assassin. To become a master at anything, you repeat the actions, thoughts and movements to hone and improve them. By the end of this game, you are so good that nothing and no one, not even Richard the Lionheart, can stand in your way, showing you have become such a master. Assassin's Creed created an identity for itself and won the goodwill of so many gamers because of it. It laid the foundation and groundwork for what was yet to come to be the biggest game in the world. It started a modern day narrative that would last for five games culminating in Assassin's Creed 3 that never once lost its continuity or narrative flow. It had future vision knowing the story that it wanted to tell across multiple installments in all three of its narrative threads and gave us now iconic imagery from the hooded figure to the hidden blade and of course the Creed's insignia. It's a shame to me that this game sits at only number five on this list. But that just means that these other games are on a completely different level. Number 4. Assassin's Creed Revelations Finally he enters the list. I mean, was there ever any doubt that Ezio was going to be this high? Even to those of us who were initially hostile towards him, because it felt like Ubisoft were dumping out our ear due to critical response, Ezio won our hearts through narrative and gameplay marrying together so beautifully. Revs is probably the greatest example of that, delivering a story that actually cared about the characters. Not just Ezio, but Sophia, Yusuf, Altair, Sixteen and Desmond too. Even those characters that aren't present like Claudia, Sean, Rebecca and even Lucy who we killed at the end of the last game. Whether playing modern day, Desmond's repressed memories, or the conclusion to the story of both Altair and Ezio, the script understands these characters and their importance to the fanbase and does all of them justice. Something that many ensemble pieces don't manage to achieve. But Revelations does it, and the story remains with you long after you are done with the game. The gameplay is the best it has ever been in the series. Cutting the fat, adding new and cool things, and even trying something a little different with a tower defense mode. Parkour is the full freedom that the series has been built on, and combat knows when to be bombastic and when to just get the job done. Social and environmental stealth offer a good level of challenge and are rewarding when pulled off. The world is busy and alive with shoppers, transport, guards and friends catching up, etc. The factions from previous games aren't immediately available. Instead, you have to enamor Ezio to them so that they will help the Assassin Brotherhood, showing an alive and evolving world around the protagonist. As Ezio liberates the oppression of an absent Ottoman overlord and the Templar Order, the streets start to sound more jovial, and the world evolves in minute ways that have a massive and lasting positive impression. For utilizing the same Anvil engine as Assassin's Creed 1, 2 and Brotherhood before it, the graphical level of this game is a marvel, and the mechanics don't miss a beat in a five-year-old engine. Every button input has an immediate response, even if it isn't always what you were planning on doing. Ezio feels life and deadly, but not quite to the level of the previous game. Revelation shows us that our badass character is aging, and that approaches to situations will need to be handled differently than what you did in previous games. This isn't actually the case. You can still blast through areas with the same speed and decimation as either AC2 or Brotherhood, but the story, animations and characterization lead you to believe that this is the case, and that's powerful. It was the first game to take an introspective look at the assassins as well. Before this point, wherever the assassins were, there was at least balance, if not an overwhelming sense of victory. Revelation showed us that that wasn't always the case. The Ottoman assassins were just about keeping their heads above water, losing members on the regular, and if this conflict didn't shift drastically, were on the verge of being wiped out. It showed that the mythos of the Assassin's Creed world was much wider and much more complex than the three previous games had led us to believe. It showed why this secret war was still raging in 2012, aka the modern day, and that freedom, liberty and peace didn't always win, even in this fictional universe. Revelations is the culmination of five years of work on a series and character set. 
It is the swan song for the original and hyper-innovative Anvil engine, and a welcome to the party of the narrative team led by Darby McDevitt. It shows a level of understanding of the existing characters, narrative and fan base that personally I don't think we saw again until 2018's God of War and Marvel's Spider-Man. By all measurable aspects, Revelations is the best game that this series has ever produced. There is so little to pick apart and negatively critique. I would personally throw the tower defense out as something that didn't work, but I'm still glad they tried it. Some would say a lack of returning characters hampers the experience, but that's kind of the point of the game. Can Ezio still perform in a new and weird environment without his connections? Outside of this, the game is a near masterpiece, with only the odd bug counting against it here and there. It sits at fourth in my list because it introduced me to the concept and feeling of franchise fatigue. I knew at the time that it was better than what we'd had previously. I knew this could well be the best that we'll ever get in the series, especially with the modern day looking like it was starting to wrap up the overall narrative. I knew it was brilliant, but it felt like I'd been there and done that all too regularly in recent times. It's wonderful returning to the game now without those feelings. I played this directly after Valhalla, and it reminded me of the stupendous heights this franchise once soared at, and what we were missing in the more modern games. But those original feelings still linger whenever I think on the title, and despite its brilliance, there are major aspects and plot points that I didn't remember until replaying it more recently. So when making this list, I had to take that into account, which is why it sits at a still super respectable fourth in my rankings. Number 3. Assassin's Creed 2 When this game was announced, my brother and I were very down on it. We both adored Altair, and with no explanation as to why he suddenly wasn't the main ancestor that we were playing as, we both assumed that Ubisoft had had a knee-jerk reaction to narrow-minded press outlets and dropped a wonderful character to appease them. Boy, were we wrong. Assassin's Creed 2 was always going to change the ancestor. This is something that was in place before the launch of the original game. The narrative was realized, but there were many concerns that many gamers felt needed to be addressed around gameplay and mechanics. And despite my adoration of the first game, I would agree, then and now. AC2 picked up immediately after the last game, with Lucy breaking Desmond out of Abstergo. Before leaving though, we're thrown into the Animus once more for two downloads, one of another of Desmond's ancestors, and information from Subject 16. We then play as Desmond for an extended stealth and action sequence, something completely different and much more involved than the last game, and it has a huge impact on our connection to the actual main character of the series. We then finally meet up with the assassins in the modern day, and find out why Desmond is so important. Within the ancestor memories, we lived a character's entire life. Whereas with Altair we came in when he'd already spent 20 plus years as an assassin, we were literally there at Ezio's birth. As a character that you'll spend a good amount of hours playing as, being there at the start builds an instant connection, and when we next play as Ezio, even though it's the first time he actually has characterization, you already feel a strong sense of connection to him. Within half an hour, Assassin's Creed 2 has thrown us into a jailbreak, stealth escape, hand-to-hand -hand combat, update on the secret war which the assassins are losing, more information on Abstergo's plans and current activity, new modern day characters with optional additional dialogue to flesh out said characters, childbirth, training, and a fight on a bridge in Renaissance Firenze. All of these aspects and moments are Ubisoft addressing concerns raised in that last game and correcting them, but it's subtle. They're built intrinsically into the narrative, and not a case of a big flag saying, Hey, look what we've improved! By the time the title card drops after a free-running race against Ezio's brother up a church, the player is completely hooked. Ezio grows throughout the game, changing from an arrogant noble to a measured, gentle man and deadly force. And this is in no small part due to the vast, realised and perfectly characterised supporting cast from historical figures realised once again as real people, to beautiful fictional characters, whose purpose may only be to drive the narrative, but they still feel real in terms of interactions and off-screen activity. It's so much more that elevates this game though, 
Every mechanic is tweaked and improved. Free running is faster and more fluid, even though it's the same engine and base mechanics. It has additional skills added on that are learned through narrative moments. Combat is near identical, but Ezio has more weapon types, animations and enemy variety. Just this increase in variety improves engagement with the system that is still counter-based for the best results. Social Stealth has visual clues and you can move while using Eagle Vision. You then add in the Subject 16 glyphs, which enter you into a puzzle-solving minigame that then give you backstory to the entire series through conspiracy theories and the truth segments. A paired-back collectathon of a hundred feathers that actually serves a narrative purpose at its inception, midpoint and conclusion. Dual hidden blades, codex pages, hidden gun, confession rooms and actually getting to use an Apple of Eden. And that's just mechanics and things to do in the game. Like the original, the story takes place throughout multiple cities and towns. They are much more varied in AC2 though. From the tall and occupied Toscana to the perfect recreations of artistic Firenze and coastal Venezia, which you can use to navigate around the real locations by learning you around the in-game ones. Every location has a unique look and feel, changing the way you get around and interact with the world in each locale. It's an improvement over the Holy Land, as Assassin's Creed didn't always achieve that uniqueness, instead only having the odd region that was vastly different. The locations are bustling and busy, alive and working to a level that the series somehow cannot achieve today. Every city also sounds unique and is in tune with the real world history of those places at the time, lending further life and reality to each location. And of course, the narrative is beautiful. When I spoke to my brother about making this list, I wanted his input on Assassin's Creed 2, as we were both living with our parents at the time and playing it side by side. He says that Ezio's early life character development, bearing in mind there are two more Ezio games after this one, and variation in areas are big points, both of which we've covered. But he then said, most of all, story. I think the story outshines most of the rest of the series. And you know what? He's right. We're 12 years after the release of this game now, and on only three occasions out of ten, could I say that a story in an Assassin's Creed was on par with, or better, than this one. One was Revelations, the other two are coming up. This game wasn't self-contained, only caring about the story that it wanted to tell. It realised what had come before and what was coming afterwards. The entire purpose of the game was to prepare us for the future, and what at the time was a fully realised conclusion to the series. We had a quickly evolving modern day narrative, with Desmond becoming super skilled in movement and combat, the bleeding effect negatively impacting his psyche, and something bigger coming when Minerva, a member of the Precursor race, actually spoke directly to Desmond through Ezio's memories. Ezio was trained throughout the game to become a master assassin, with the narrative filling the blanks around the Borgia family as the antagonists. History you could easily go and look up outside of the game. He lost much of his blood kin, but learned that family is what you make it, and built a wonderful one around himself throughout the 20 plus year time span of this narrative. He had direct and fully realised links to Altair, who by proxy of the Codex was teaching Ezio to be the master assassin that he was growing into, and the moment with Minerva would lead directly to the ending of Revelations, where we lay Altair to rest and Ezio converses directly with Desmond. As an aside, this game also taught me rudimentary Italian, allowing me to visit places such as Rome or Sorrento, Pompeii and the southern edge of Mont Blanc, and actually get by in the native tongue. It's no conversation ability, but I'm able to be a tourist in Italian. All from a game. Impressive. It's difficult to be either a beginning point or a successor, but Assassin's Creed 2 manages to be both, starting the three game journey with Ezio and honouring what came with Altair before. It sets up the greatest story this franchise has ever seen and catapulted the series to heights it can only dream of now, with universal praise and adulation. In a single quote then, it's absolutely brilliant. Number 2. Assassin's Creed Origins By the end of Syndicate, the franchise was fully fatigued. Writers couldn't churn out stories quick enough, developers couldn't create and quality check the worlds, directors couldn't do multiple takes in mocap to get the best results, and the fans wanted something more, 
as nondescript as that was. Origins then acts as a soft reboot to the Assassin's Creed franchise and brought with it wholesale change. Gone was the core concept that we had known for nine games previous. Here there were no assassins, there were no Templars, there was no Desmond and no initiate program. Instead, our first view of the game is before the current calendar and sees Ptolemy riding through Siwa flanked by masked men. Before a nightmare flash strikes the screen, followed by a scene of the last Magi acting in pure rage and killing a member of the Masked Order. Four minutes from the main menu to this point, and I don't know about you guys, but I was engrossed. To then be thrown into a boss fight to learn the new combat was intense. Exploring the world, meeting the characters we'd be interacting with throughout, relearning how to climb and jump in this new AC world, and witnessing the stunning acting of Abu Bakr Salim as Bayek of Siwa had me relishing in the changes that Assassin's Creed Origins had enacted. The narrative gave an obvious similar feeling to Star Wars Episode 3, where you know what the ending will be. You know from the very beginning that we will be forming the Assassin's Brotherhood in this game, and the journey is made all the better for it. You see aspects of the Creed that you've known for years being thought about and implemented. You see the personal connection of things such as the leap of faith, you see the Creed's insignia being along for the ride from moment one of the story in Bayek's necklace. And we discover the reason why the heightened sense we've known since Altair is called Eagle Vision. Bayek is the best ancestor since Ezio, with thought out beautiful and poignant characterization, and his story showcases and elicits so many varying emotions. Aya is a powerful female lead, even if she isn't front and center for this story. Her purpose is far greater in spreading the Brotherhood of the Hidden Ones, as we discover in the game the original name of the Assassins, across the world. The supporting cast of people like Cleopatra and Caesar are beautifully realized and serve an important narrative purpose while also showcasing historical accuracy. It complements and reinforces lore that we have known about since the Assassin Tombs in AC2 and even puts some of that on screen. It explains the missing finger from back in AC1 and creates an initial version of the three tenets of the Creed. While attempting to reboot the series, Origins knew the stock that it had come from. While mechanically it was very different, removing social stealth and free running, and offering a more Souls-like combat, a literally climb anything ethos, level gated areas and a skill tree, due to a well thought out narrative, brilliantly acted cast, and a return to the setup, payoff, intrigue and cliffhanger storytelling structure it actually felt like a fully realized Assassin's Creed once more. When this game launched, there wasn't the disappointments of Odyssey and Valhalla to contend with. Origins brought with it all the cues of a great Assassin's Creed overarching plot that could then be taken through multiple games. We had a modern day character once more, and a pretty damn smart one at that, if not genius level, having developed an animus that could access any genetic memory as long as you had a DNA sample and was portable. She wasn't affiliated to either order, which was a hugely interesting angle to take, and offered the possibility of a look at either the Templars or Assassins from the outside. We see through Layla's eyes the major negatives of each side of this conflict, and the reluctance she has to be thrown into a millennia-old war. She's an engineer, and the Animus is her passion. She cares not for the tribulations of two factions who have just threatened her life and killed her friend. By the end of the game, she speaks with William Miles, Desmond's father and a true link to the older titles, showing this is still Assassin's Creed. He offers her a spot in the Brotherhood, and she only goes along because she's safer with the Assassins for the moment. This dynamic is amazing. We have the start of an intriguing modern day story, a character who can go through an arc that is similar to Edward or Desmond from earlier in the series, or maybe even completely different and tell a new and wonderful story. What a shame that Odyssey then squandered all that hard work and setup. Origins revitalized the creed for me. It made me want to play. It made me want more of the story. It took me 100 hours to platinum the game, and still I wanted more and have returned to it multiple times since its launch. It kept the important aspects of the old while bringing in the new and married them together in a way that worked so well. It had additional development time and is one of the most highly polished and finished games in the series because of this. 
It set up the prospect of a Bayek and Aya trilogy as leaked before launch that would have seen the Brotherhood from formation to continent and worldwide instigation. At the time, it was everything that older fans such as myself had asked for and could easily evolve over time to become the AC that had come before and give us a full circle story. It was different and refreshing enough to bring in new fans, and even though the levelling was a bit harsh, there was very little to detract from an otherwise excellent game. Origins succeeded in its mission and surpassed the expectations of many, myself included. It gave the series life when critically and financially it was almost dead. It created a level of hype around the creed for its continuing modern day and historical stories and opened up many doors for stories with the precursors, which through this game we now knew called themselves Isu. It was superb in my eyes, with great story, graphics and mechanics, and still is superb for me. By far and away the greatest game of this ancient trilogy, and for me, only beaten by one other game in the entire series. Number 1 Assassin's Creed Brotherhood It had no right to exist, let alone achieve anything. Eight months. Eight months is the development time Brotherhood had. Okay, it had a leg up with the engine, mechanics and assets already being in place thanks to Assassin's Creed 2. But still, eight months to build a completely new and historically accurate map. Eight months to write and tweak a script. Eight months to motion capture and voice record that script. Eight months to animate every face and movement of every character model. Eight months to improve the graphics and mechanics in an engine you've already got what you thought was the most out of. And to top it all off, eight months to create a multiplayer experience for a single player franchise. For all intents and purposes, Brotherhood should have failed. Yet 11 years after its launch, myself and so many others still hold it up as the best of the series. Brotherhood does so much right, nearly everything in fact. It is the first time that all three narratives have equal weight within the series. When you are playing modern day, you want to play the ancestor story. When playing the ancestor, you want to uncover the precursor story. When investigating the precursors, the modern day is calling. And through it all, Subject 16 is yet again in the peripherals with a new message about the truth of human history. The story builds from the end of the last game in all narrative threads. There are lengthy parkour sections as Desmond, where he and Lucy chat. They grow their friendship and characters, and maybe even something more. There is a tangible, visible link between the modern day and the past, with most of the Desmond sections taking place in Monteregioni. Ezio's entire quest is to recover the apple after Monteregioni is sacked by Cesare Borgia and hide it for Desmond to then find 500 years later. The precursors that have read time have influenced both protagonists so that they can interact through time and achieve the goal of getting Desmond to the temple slash lab underneath the Colosseum. The pacing, characterization, antagonists, intrigue, discovery, everything just scratches a narrative itch that all fans of the previous two games have. But it does it better. It's the same for gameplay. That's what is so good about Brotherhood. There's not much here that's new. Sure, we get to play around with a crossbow and a parachute, which expand your stealth and life-saving options when Ezio randomly launches to his doom, aka I press the wrong button. And there's some amazing side quests where you get to play with Leonardo's inventions, bringing unique gameplay to those sections. But everything else we've been doing for two games previously. Except here, it's better. Free running is more precise. Combat is faster, leaner, more varied and more brutal. Stealth is integral to the plot and a new 100% sync mechanic adds an additional level of challenge and replayability to the game. Mechanically, you actually get to act as a master assassin and recruit, train and order a team of assassins to liberate Rome, adding additional narrative depth through this mechanic. The entire supporting cast bar one return in Brotherhood and have advancing, changing and personal arcs. Rome is a perfect recreation and like AC2 before it, allows real world navigation of the historical city if learned well enough. And then there's multiplayer. Another thing that shouldn't have worked. Another thing that the fanbase berated before launch. But to this day, 
I still think it's one of the best PvP experiences ever released. It rewards patience and stealth. It plays like a cat and mouse type game. And as you level up, you become even more deadly with new and better tools. I ranked within the top 200 people in the world during its lifespan. As a comparison, Destiny that I have a combined 4,000 plus hour playtime across two games, I'm in the bottom 17% for PvP. It gives you an idea of the engagement this mode brought. The solid mechanics and connections, the amazing fun and engaging game modes, a level playing field, no matter who you were. It just screamed quality and polish at the time, and still does today if you revisit it, though getting a game is a lot more difficult now due to population drop-off. I constantly will Ubisoft to launch the Assassin's Creed multiplayer as a free-to-play title and move all microtransactions to that game. It'd work so well and improve all Assassin's Creed experiences moving forward. The important thing when they made this game, I think, was a clarity of vision. From day one, it appears as if the entire team knew what the end product would be, what they were aiming to achieve. It was a lofty goal, but no one thought it impossible or let up throughout development to deliver the best thing the series had or has ever seen. It was comprehensive, from its narrative to its iconography, single to multiplayer, gameplay and graphics to lead characters. It was the complete and highly polished Assassin's Creed experience. It feels exactly the same returning to it 11 years later as it did in 2010. And while I may have struggled to rank quite a few of these titles, Assassin's Creed Brotherhood always stood tall as a beacon for the rest of the series to aim for in terms of completeness, quality and engagement. I would like to thank you all very much for tuning in. This list was much more difficult to put together than I first anticipated. And especially 6 through 2, where all of the games are what I would call exceptional. So I understand if you guys maybe don't agree with the order that I have given to these titles. As I said in my disclaimer, feel free to discuss it with me in the comments. I'm always willing to talk to other Assassin's Creed fans and have a discussion about which is best, what mechanics worked, what didn't, and all that sort of stuff. So definitely hit me up down below and tell me what your ranking is more than anything else and why maybe you disagree or agree with mine. In the meantime though, I would like to thank you all very much for tuning in. I would like to thank you all for listening to my waffle. Um, I felt that from six onwards, it needed a bit more explanation as to why I've put things where I've put things. That's why the videos ended up probably twice as long as I wanted it to be. But better quality, I think, overall. So don't forget to hit that like button, subscribe, slap the bell for notifications so you can see when new videos do go live on the channel. In the meantime, guys, have yourselves an absolutely fantastic day. My name is Doragon, this is my list of rankings for the Assassin's Creed games in 2021, and until next time, take care.